everyone. Welcome to the Comics Who Show. I'm your co-host, Patrick Lugo, and with me is co-host, Curtis Vegeta. As a kid, I loved Kung Fu movies. So I went to Chinatown, trained with a wise teacher, and became a Kung Fu master. Sounds simple, right? Not really. My journey, like the study of Kung Fu, was as arduous as it was rewarding, filled with as many secrets as revelations and as much heartache as triumph. It's a defining moment in my life, and while I began studying Kung Fu to learn how to fight, what I discovered was a way to live. Martial arts never came easy to me. I was far from talented and even farther from being the chosen one. It was only through years of tenacious perseverance that I was able to make steady progress. And so, I was surprised when my master told me that I should teach Kung Fu and share the art outside of Chinatown. I did just that and taught Kung Fu to my own students for 20 years. I always wanted to do more to share the art of Kung Fu with others, but was limited by only being able to teach those within my immediate area. What about the rest of the world? Then one day, I had one of the deepest insights about Kung Fu. I realized that the punches, kicks, throws, and myriad of martial maneuvers are merely the delivery system for the true essence of Kung Fu, the philosophy and way of life. Having worked for years as a professional artist and storyteller in film, animation, video games, and comic books, I realized that I could draw upon this unique skill set to share my passion for Kung Fu with the greater world. And so I created Shadow Ghost, a Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. The first issue is created entirely by myself, from story and art to colors and lettering. Every panel is filled with unprecedented accuracy in its depiction of Kung Fu by a comic book creator who knows from first-hand experience what it means to be a Kung Fu master. Battle Ghost is a martial arts coming-of-age story about a young man who search for the truth about a legendary hero leads him to study Kung Fu and, through a twist of fate, becomes part of the legend himself. For the first time in comic book history, you can immerse yourself further in each issue with Kung Fu Skills technology, powered by Tiger Crane Kung Fu. Scan the QR code at the back of the comic and follow an exclusive link to an online instructional video where I teach you Kung Fu techniques featured in this series. With Kung Fu Skills technology, you can do more than just read about the Shadow Ghost Saga. You can become a part of it. The first issue is completely finished and ready for print. All that's needed is for you to make a pledge of support so that we can fund the printing of the first issue. Together, we can share the wisdom of Kung Fu with the greater world. Shadow Ghost is the story of Kung Fu. It's about the people, the art, the culture, and the philosophy. It's my story and the story of those that I've learned from, taught, fought, and loved. Join me and become part of the vibrant legacy in a place and time where we might not be the chosen one, but where we can make a choice to be part of something bigger and greater than just ourselves. I'm Sifu Curtis Fujita, and this is Shadow Ghost, the Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. Hi, I'm Plugo, author, illustrator, comic creator, and the art director for Kung Fu Magazine for more than 20 years. But I'm here to talk to you about a project that's really special to me. It's the middle grade graphic novel, A Tiger's Tale. Imagine the story of tigers and dragons and martial artists and monsters. So when I launched the campaign for A Tiger's Tale Volume 1, I did not know what to expect but it succeeded thanks to a group of passionate backers. It was also awarded the Make More Comics art grant that year. 
and was later featured as part of an art gallery exhibit. And that's why I'm coming to Kickstarter, to cover production fees, printing, copy editing, things like that. Books completed, with the exception of a few pages I've set aside for color over the course of the campaign. This turned out to be a popular feature of Volume 1's campaign, so I thought I'd bring it back for Volume 2. I think it's going to be great fun for everyone. Hope you'll support the campaign. I'm very excited about it. Thanks for stopping by. Okay, everybody, welcome to the Comics Fu Show. Where we stand at the crossroads of comics, kung fu, and pop culture of all sorts. Excellent. I'm uh, Patrick Lugo. Uh, known as Plugo Online, author, illustrator, comic creator. Uh, my most recent graphic novel is A Tiger's Tale, Volume 2, currently on Kickstarter and looking for just 30 more backers to reach our goal of 100. Excellent. And I'm Curtis Fujita, a Kung Fu instructor, comic book creator. Uh, my Kickstarter campaign is also uh, live right now. It's Shadow Ghost, the Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. And both our campaigns are running at the same time, so check both of us out. But enough about us. I am, like, super excited about our guest today. Um, I'd say comic book royalty is, is an understatement, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Patrick uh, take the baton and, and make the, the full introduction. So. Well, so here's the thing, Curtis. <clears throat> what I'm particularly pleased with about our special guest is that um, early when I started uh, my career as a comic book journalist, he was one of the first subjects that, that I dove into and, um, you know, wrote a whole piece about the work that he was doing at the time and its place and history. And um, it was a fun piece. It was a little bit controversial. People were like a little bit upset about it, but still that, that kind of was fun too. But um, the, the great thing is that if I was to dig up that piece and put it on my blog now, it would probably be, still be relevant because the work he was doing at the time still has a place today so um with that said let, let, let me introduce to you our uh, author david quinn hi guys Hello. hi everybody hi. welcome Thanks to the show paying attention <laughs> How welcome we david <laughs> happy to be here excellent great 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 to have you on the show it's it, it, it's so exciting i mean um i don't think that there's really anybody else in comic book history that can be quite as fearless as what you've put out and when you put it out and what you've the trailblazing that you've done uh, for comic books. So it, it, it's a real honor. That's nice. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a strong compliment that I take seriously and, and respect and I'm humbled by it at the same time, because I want to live up to it. Um, some of the stuff you do when you put your work out there, as you guys know, um, you put your work out there and it doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to the world. And then you may have a persona in the world that's not entirely the same thing as what you are inside, you know, and that's a little philosophical, but it's also just kind of basic. So, you know, you have to, you have to have room to grow, continue to grow in your own spirit and your own body and your own soul and your own mind. And, and you also have to, I mean, acknowledge that sometimes Parts of your persona belong to the world and, he, and not yourself anymore, not myself anymore. When Tim Vigil and I put Faust out into the world, we were young, young men. Um, we had some chops because he had done some illustration and I had done some theater and music writing and performance. And so we thought we had some skills we could put to making comics, which we'd love since we were tiny little kids reading, you know, Spider-Man, Conan and Tomb of Dracula. Um, maybe especially Tomb of Dracula. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we thought we had something to give, but once it went out there, it, it, like I said, it belonged to the world. And, you know, so we still, we still carry that with us and that still informs what we're doing today. 
Um, but part of the reason I'm here is because I met Patrick through a completely different kind of organization. I don't think I even had the pleasure of seeing the like, like 29, 30-year-old Faust article we're talking about. I might have the numbers wrong. But, you know, that, that's a book that started in 87 and was still going strong in, in the 90s and, 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 and had a bit of a hiatus when the comic book market depressed um, and finally finished in 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. Look at all that. So, yeah, I just really quickly did an image search just to give <laughs> folks who may not be familiar just a, a, a taste of, of what was happening. So, yeah, the article was written probably around 87. Mm -hmm. um, I had just joined, I had just started uh, art school at the time. And what myself and a few cohorts had done is we had taken over the school newspaper to fill it with a comic section. And then we were such- West Coast. This was in New York, the State okay. University of New York. I know York. you started out here on the East Coast where I am, and now you're in the, on the West Coast where Tim Vigil is. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I made that trek, but before I headed West, we took over. We took over the school newspaper. The newspaper became a dust jacket for the huge <laughs> comic section that filled up the news that we just kept adding pages to, and you know we each did our own comic art, our own comic strips, yeah, and then really we would, sounds like it had a life of its own. It, it did, and you know because it was a school funded project, yeah. we could print ex tons of extra copies. And then bring them to the local comic shops and just have this newspaper. You know, we'd peel away the student newspaper part and have this comics rampage that we called and, you know, drop them off at all the local comic shops that had articles that, had, you know, it was printed as a newspaper on newsprint. Great fun. Learn, learn tons about like the whole DIY mm -hmm. element of, of comic, of art in general, but comics in particular. That was a great day for that when we paid attention to people like um, Eastman and Laird doing the Turtles and Dave Sim and uh, Wendy Peeney, several other people um, who were just making their books and putting them out. Puma Blues was another great one by some guys I knew from Massachusetts. And, and you know, people were just making their own. It was it was like the paper equivalent of the punk rock uh, from the previous decade. And, you know, I got off on that, and I also get off on the fact that, and I, this is kind of where I was going by mentioning you, Patrick. I didn't meet you until we were both in another world, totally, in the world of Kids Comics Unite, um, which is an online network which began during COVID and was sort of a networking and educational resource that became a online community, um, and we're both still members and both active in our own ways. Uh, Patrick is just one of the leaders, really. So, I mean, we're, um, we're talking about making middle grade graphic novels, read aloud children's books. Um, and in a way, it, some, it's almost light years away from where I began in comics and in theater. But in another way, it's not, because it's always going to be about the story and the stories are always kind of like about somebody trying to find the truth or trying to learn who they are or just trying to be themselves, get out of their own way and be who they are uh, and discover the joy of life and discover their own agency and power. So, I mean, it's like we're doing it for little kids now as well. Um, I go back to that point about persona. I have found it easier in many ways to keep doing what I started doing. Um, it was what took me to Marvel because they were like, oh, well, he's got a serious underground horror hit. If we're serious about making Doctor Strange a little bit darker, why don't we let him try, you know? And it, it is also what brought me to everything else I've done was that urge to be creative and try different stories for different days and for different audiences. But, you know, I've always had an impact and people have always trusted me to do something that's on the scary side, on the extreme side, uh, willing to be transgressive, willing to be a little complicated. Um, and, you know, so I, I'm working on teen comics, like a series I'm working on with um, Vincent Zorzolo and Claudia Balboni uh, called The Addiction, which takes a very... Um, 
serious <laughs> social problem, addiction of all kinds, and kind of puts it through the drama prism um, of basically a comic comic book series that kind of looks like a crime comic and has elements of comedy and has elements of superhero. It's really kind of a mixed bag. And it's really like hopefully going to be fun for teens and other readers that have some sophistication more than middle grade readers. What's amazing is that kid comics are now for kids again. You know, <laughs> after after decades of comics determined to prove their, you know, their adulthood, now it's kind of gone full circle. And now that people are intentionally writing comics for like specific age groups you know this is for middle grade this is for early reader this is for teenage and i mean i think that's where like something like faust really just hit when the iron was hot you know and it just was like okay well if we're gonna be adult about it let's let's truly be adult to you know to the extreme and and it moved the needle right like i mean to this day right we just um not so long ago, Faust was re-offered on Kickstarter, and it exploded. It was amazing to see how well it did. Oh, I can brag. We, we raised $30,000 in the first 20 minutes. That was our goal. So, I mean, we, we, we hit the goal right away. And, you know, originally we sold out um, the allotted number of copies we decided to print to 801 backers. And I'm, I'm looking at the page here, and it looks like uh, you've wound up with... One hundred eighteen thousand three hundred seventy-six uh, dollars for the funding. Which yes, is just thank tremendous. you, readers, and we're going <laughs> to good use. Trust us, we're going to make a beautiful hardcover edition, oversized, and it's paving the way for other editions to be able to follow. Oh, that's so. Um, it's not an easy time for hardcover publishing right now, so it's taking us a while. It's not an easy time for. Uh, <laughs> in the area of content and censorship, and I'm talking all kinds of censorship, there's censorship coming from every direction these days. <laughs> and then, so, I mean, you know, there's, it's not an easy time for that either. So we're having our struggles. It kind of almost reminds me of the satanic panic of the eighties all over again. And we're so grateful to the, the people that supported us. Um, we honestly had some, books over the years that were just sort of breaking even. And we thought, well, maybe the time has passed. But once we got to, look, this is the entire thing. You're going to get the whole book oversized. You're going to be able to take it home and put it on your shelf and be glad you have it and share it with your friends. So thank you. <laughs> That's great. You know, I would be curious if you could kind of remark because I think Faust is the perfect kind of example. So you were kind of there for the initial kind of indie, you know, boom right of the mm -hmm. black and white printing on and then in some ways i feel we've, we've progressed maybe regressed but as far as right now there's almost this other renaissance of indie with crowdfunding and the ability to do that but mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned censorship too i mean you know um how would you how would you feel that narrative is when you first did faust as opposed to now because now we see you know kind of cancel culture movement and things like that i'd be curious about the dichotomy of those two flashpoint moments Especially it's interesting. It's complex, and I don't even know if I'm good enough of a social reader and to, to really comment with value on it. But from my perspective, you're right. Um, comics, until the black and white boom, which my partner Tim Vigil was a big part of, and then I followed into it and contributed to it, we did, we sort of were among a bunch of leaders, you know, dozens of people doing it at the time who were very DIY and very independent and very creator's rights based, very much about, you know, a, a democratic and, and free thinking, anything goes kind of publishing. And that goes in and out of favor with, as you say, all walks of life and all political spectrums. Um, for whatever reason, there's always people trying to control ideas that aren't theirs. And I'm really, really careful not just to blame this on only one kind of person, because we all have a little bit of that judgment. And some people have a lot more than others. And whether they're, whether they're saying it comes from their politics or their religion or their faith, or, or I don't know, from aliens, I don't know, whatever they, whatever justification they give, I always think, well, those people have a right to what they want to do and the way they want to live. 
And at the same time, other people should have the freedom from being imposed upon by that right. So that's, I guess I'm still a real DIY, free thinking kind of person. None of the extreme judgment really works too well for me. So at the same time, there's another thing going on, and that is comics were sort of monolithic, right? It was Marvel and DC, and then there were a few independents. And then all of a sudden, there were tons of independents. So many that, you know, they were um, kind of going through boom and bust. And I think our pop culture today is very, very fragmented. It's not monolithic at all. So you can go and you can watch um, something like The Boys on a streaming television network. And it's definitely not for everybody, but it's like you can say like, oh, okay, this, this is the grandchild of Faust. Or you can watch something extremely different or 102 flavors of something extremely different on all the other streaming channels and all the other blogs and all the other TikToks and all the other social media and everything. We're just faced with um, so many choices. I think it's the long tail where everything can exist simultaneously if we can just like let each other be. For me to meet, for me to be right doesn't mean you have to be wrong. You know, I think, <laughs> I think there's this kind of thing where I have to be right, you have to be wrong. And it's like, you know, this definitely has to be that live and let live under, you know, as many circumstances as possible. Well, you guys study and, and, and teach the, the way of life that is Kung Fu, right? And I have only like a tiny, tiny, I'll, I'll tell you, it's almost a joke. My tiny little exposure to Kung Fu is <laughs> um, I was a vol parent volunteer at a school for Mandarin language every Saturday morning here in Westchester, New York, because my daughter was born in China. And she was due for eight years. She studied Chinese, Mandarin, and also dance from that part of the world, and also Kung Fu. <laughs> so as a parent volunteer, we found the class was a bizarre collection of over 50 dads and under 10 kids. <laughs> but even, even with like old guy and little girls and little boys, um, Kung Fu classes, we couldn't help but be exposed to the way it sort of takes over. If you let it, it sort of takes over. Um, just the way, like, if you say, like, well, I don't know how to meditate, but you sit down and you breathe and you focus on it. You know, you're not a Buddhist, but you're actually doing some sort of focused breathing, intentional exercise that is affecting your body and your concentration and maybe even your health. <laughs> so so it, it just sort of takes over, even if you're doing kind of like silly dads who can can't really do burpees anymore, but they'll do whatever they have to do because they're doing it with their 10 year old, you know? <laughs> Definitely. Well, it's like, we're all, we're all trapped in this, in this, you know, hardware. Right. So it's, you know, but, but I, I would, I think, I would think Patrick would agree with me. You know, you, you are a Kung Fu master in your own right, because Kung Fu is, is, isn't just a martial art. It's, it's acquiring a high level of skill that, and, and going through, a, you know, the term Sifu that we associate with a Kung Fu instructor in China, sometimes they'll associate that with a chef or a writer or a painter, you know, so mm. everybody meets closer to the top of the mountain, you know. And or any we, teacher? Uh, Is yeah. any teacher a Sifu? Yeah, because the word Sifu is composed of the words for father and teacher combined. So I think it's it, the thing that I think that it harkens to is this idea of apprenticeship, which I think we've kind of lost here in the modern era. Um, beyond a teacher, a father figure, a parent figure, but also acquiring a high level of skill. And so, you know, you know, Kung Fu isn't just the, the, the martial arts, just achieving a high level of skill. And obviously, you know, you've, you, you've, you're extremely adept at that. And um, everybody sees the end result, right? I'm sure nobody knows what headaches and hardships mm -hmm. you've gone to, to acquire that skill, and then to maintain it over such a, a lengthy career. Um, well, I went back to my college a couple of years ago, and I, everyone, everyone that was a teacher or a professor, I said, um, I'm going to put myself out there because I always get more than I give when I go and talk to young people who want to be in the arts. Um, 
So if you have people that are working on storytelling, or if you have people that are working on visual arts or performing arts, I've done a little bit of all those things. And I, I think I definitely have things to offer about how to be yourself, find yourself and put yourself out there and take a risk and, and do all the things you have to do. Like, you know, just do the work. And like, as a writer, I tell writers, write it now, fix it later. If you can't do that, you're not going to be a writer. You got to, unless you have a page of garbage to fix later, you don't have anything. So write it now, just sit down and write. So anyway, so I, I'm always talking like that and I, and it keeps me honest. I was going to ask you also about your Doctor Strange work. Cause I remember reading that and I remember like having a bit of a feeling like a bit of personal victory in the changes that were that were being made at the time to accommodate like the new writer, the new look, you know. Like Curtis, I don't know if you recall this, but yeah. I was calling it Doctor Strange's John Lennon phase myself. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Including the primal screams. <laughs> well, um, I don't know. I was fortunate to have that experience and I worked with some great editors, Bobby Chase, Tom Brevoort, Evan Skolnick. Work with some great artists, Kyle Oates, Peter Gross, Mel Ruby. Work with artists that I um, had re read their work when I was, God, just learning to read, like um, Gene Colan and Marv Wolfman and um, Marie Severin. And so, I mean, uh, you know, I never... Steve Ditko wasn't doing any Doctor Strange in 1993. And it wasn't even any point in asked him because he pretty much, you know, made his own way with Mr. A and his own, his own DIY books. So he was out of the picture. But um, it was almost that primal to work with the, some of the people from the 70s and, and late 60s that I had a chance to work with. So it was the ultimate exercise in playing 90s comics, 90s mainstream comics, kind of by their own rules, but also trying to do something a little more transgressive in what I thought was interesting. And it, I had a story that was very much like a personal personality crisis for Doctor Strange that would let him rebuild himself and rediscover new power. And powers, and this was important to me, and this might have something to do with Faust, <laughs> powers that aren't based on some other entity, like the Vishanti or the devil or God, but powers that were based on earth, <laughs> you know, spirit, you know, whatever, you know, powers that are more primal. So I was... Um, I was thrilled to have a chance to do it. And I had to play all the 90s games because comics have their games. Like, it's crossover, by the way. Your first three issues, they're all crossovers. So don't don't think you're just telling your story. <laughs> you have to start here and end here. And by the way, Morbius is in this. Oh, okay. Well, I like Morbius. So, you know, but you play that game. But I work with great people, great editors, as I said. And I did a few other crazy things at Marvel as a result like some very strange carnage stories and some ultraverse stories that were told at the end of the period of the ultraverse after Marvel bought it. And it was kind of like, what the hell? Anything goes now, you know, this is great. It's a crazy time in comics and we could do almost anything. I, I worked for Malibu at, uh, during the okay. ultraverse. I was, I was, I was a teenager. And, um, and 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 I don't know if you if you if you had ever seen this, but I was a teenager at the time. Uh, that's but the funny thing is is I remember Tim Vigil. He sent in a thing that got rejected from Marvel, which I thought was this pinup. Of, I don't know if you remember there was a character called Nightman, and there was a mm. Nightman and Wolverine crossover, and he sent in this glorious pinup of Wolverine decapitating Nightman and holding his bloody severed head. And I, I just remember it, we sent it over to a Marvel editorial for approval, and we just got a fax back, and all it said was no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't play with the toys however yeah. you want to. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what else to say about that period. I think about it all the time. Marvel uh, published 
a huge thousand page volume last year, which is about half me and includes almost all the stories I wrote for him. Not the Ultraverse stuff, not the Carnage stuff. Some Midnight Sun stuff is, is not in there. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's still around. They're still like keeping it in print. I still talk to people about it when I go out in public and talk about comics. I still meet people who are like, oh, those were different. You know, you know, and a few people will also say, like, if, if, you, if you risk doing something different, you're going to meet a couple of people who say, oh, yeah, you ruined that. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guy that ruined it. But, you know, get in line because there's someone else is going to ruin it next. <laughs> he he seems to have recovered since. So, <laughs> but um, I want to I want to test your memory and mine because I, I haven't read them since, you know, since the individual floppies came out. But um. Is this when he started, when Doctor Strange, when the concept of chaos magic was introduced into Doctor Strange? That was more towards the end when earth magic and chaos magic came into it as other ways. He started completely with the 1960s origin of Himalayan voyage, uh, you know, meeting ancient gods, giving him power, learning the discipline to handle it. And then his rising through the years of consistently two steps forward and one step back in terms of mastering what he's trying to do. <laughs> and also he has, um, Strange has a crisis and they, they did this pretty well in the first movie, I noticed. Strange always has a crisis of getting ahead of himself because he has the power and the responsibility. So he's kind of like, you know, Spider-Man is sort of the, the the light side of this Steve Ditko power and responsibility triangle, and he's always he's a kid and he's learning and he's facing up to responsibility. And he might have a huge setback sometimes, but he's basically growing. Strange, on the other hand, sometimes gets ahead of himself and starts to manipulate other people. And I did that with not only manipulating other people, but he actually manipulated like etheric beings that were, he created magical spells that looked like, you know, walking, breathing, human-ish figures. And then there were three strangers. And that's, it's not unique to do that with characters, right? Marvel's done that tons of times over the years of like, here's another way to do Thor, you know? Um, and I think, Everybody likes stories like that because we all have uh, masks that we wear. So sometimes we face another person who's like, got him a different mask. <laughs> oh, so one, one other thing I remember. So I think you introduced a more surly Wong. You kind of separated him from like the meek manservant that was like the kind of a cliche and you made him a little more like, you know, mm. not... I, I would I just would have to say surly like some there were I just remember times when he was a little bit more fed up with Doctor Strange's antics, wherein before that he was just more flat, like I'm just here to help out and then I'll go brew some more tea. Look, I gave just I just gave everyone different problems to to deal with and, and as a result they changed. As comics became more adult, part of that whole black and white boom and DIY generation changed not just the, you know, the turtles in the Faust neighborhood, but it also changed the the mainstream neighborhood a bit too, in the kinds of stories that were being told. And you wouldn't have ever had anything like the boys of the authority come along in the next generation if there hadn't been a different way of looking at all these things. And, you know, Mr. Alan Moore certainly has something to do with that, with like taking, you know, taking extreme like archetypes almost cliches and then turning them into something with feet of clay and and mental illness <laughs> you know really like playing with uh you know the what if so i mean wong in my stories wong just sort of loses patience with his role because strange abdicates his role and goes into hiding and there's another sorcerer supreme and Wong is a little bit like, fuck this. And, you know, I'm not someone who has the same background as Wong. 
But I think I would have resented all the stereotypes that you mentioned, Patrick. Right. And I would have said, like, I'm, still, I'm not just here to do some kung fu and make you tea. You know, <laughs> I have all sorts of other things I'm interested in, like my relationship with my girlfriend. <laughs> you know, I have a life. You know? it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the reason why I mention it is because, you know, looking at the Doctor Strange movie, looking at the sequel and then mm. now rumor of a Wong, you know, TV series on Disney Plus. You know, I think the character of Wong as we see him on the screen really grew from the soil that you you kind of laid down and and really like stirred up with the work that you did you know back in the day oh if i did a little piece of that great i mean i think a lot of people contributed to that um and once things got into the cinematic universe uh there was all sorts of subtlety that could be played up by the with the help of the actors and the directors and the cinematographers that um we didn't always have access to in short static you know image based entertainment <laughs> so how could you not have more depth of character and depth of heroism and you know there's all sorts of times when he appears as both hero and comic relief in the same damn scene which is pretty good. <laughs> you, you know, one, one thing I'd be kind of curious to, to delve into with you is just this idea of embracing darkness in storytelling and subject matter. I mm. think it's, you know, even, even like working on my things, I kind of self-censor sometimes. And the thing I think that's so brave and interesting about us, we all have a dark side to us. We all have dark thoughts. Um, and to actually investigate that and, and actually to, to, to have that narrative is very personal to really put a part of yourself out there that most people hide. You know, Faust is you know, such a watershed moment in comic books as far as putting that really dark visceral side of, you know, not just the narrative, but also just how, how graphically it's depicted. Was that, was that a challenge for you or was it just, you know, training those off on, you know, whatever, just go for it? Or was there, what was that journey like for you? Because it's so definitive in your work mm. in comic books at that time. I, I'm just curious how there's any navigating of that or how that worked. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a real question for anyone who wants to put themselves and put their work out there. Um, you run the risk of losing people. Yeah. And it probably came from theater and the willingness to be audacious came from theater. Um, some of it came from punk rock because at the point that I had a punk rock band. Something changed in me in every way about my um, expression and my character and my writing. And it was as if, this is gonna sound really, really basic, but it was as if I trusted that people wouldn't hate me if they, even if they hated something that I created. But that's hard. Yeah. That is very hard. Yeah. Tim and I, Tim and I at one point spoke to a very famous artist at the time, who's still a very famous artist and businessman and a leader who's influenced a lot of people. Uh, when we approached him to help us do uh, a new character, Tim and I, he was intrigued by the drama, but he actually said something like, I wouldn't want my family to see me doing something like that. And so if you're still there, you can have and a kind of an expression, but you're always gonna have, you're always gonna be held back because you just need to trust the people. Definitely, and, and I mean, that's that's the thing is you are, it's also funny when you encounter people or things where whatever the subject matter, whatever is, has gone far beyond what it actually is and what it means to them. As, as, a, as, as a Kung Fu person, right? Bruce Lee is this, you're talking about monoliths. I mean, he's, he's an institution in and of itself, you know? Oh yeah. And, and and what he means to as as a you know as a kung fu practitioner, you're always living in his shadow. And when you know the facts of his life, you realize he was a, he was a human being. He had faults. He had benefits. He had all those things. But for the most part, I will never engage in any conversation with without anybody that I'm close to about my full opinion about him. That's informed from my kung fu background um. and from historical data and things like that. Because he, it's not about him. It's about what he represents. For him, he's about the representation of Asian Americans or 
about martial arts and and you know you you don't want to hurt somebody's dream you know and even and even sometimes just causing them to question something mm. uh will will trigger you know the defense mechanism and and, and I think comic comic books are such a big thing with that, with the you know because everything's iconography. I feel like that's kind of the interplay that's going on now socially with, with um, reinterpreting certain icons and things like that, and people getting very emotional and you know it's it's a it's a delicate matter. <laughs> I'll just say that you know. But one thing one thing that came to mind about having having the faith right and and then also having having the bravery is that you don't have to answer, but. Did Faust have to be written by a younger David Quinn when you had um, less to lose versus an older David Quinn that might have more cause to be cautious? Uh, yeah, uh, yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, there's a reason like that punk rock was mostly created by younger people. But there's also plenty of old guys like me that still get up there and... and do that a little bit too because they still feel it but yeah i mean i'm olivia's dad and diane's husband and what does that mean if this guy is sort of like mayor in the neighborhood can he also be comic books bad boy i look at it as different days on one day i might write i sing the moon about a, a little girl dire wolf who trying to learn what she can do that none of the other prehistoric kids can do right that's one of my middle grade books so she feels a little bit better about what she can do so that's one kind of story but it's still got howling at the moon in it. so there's still something wild maurice sendak was in a similar situation all his life he said like i don't believe there are such things as children's books or maybe those aren't his exact words but he said there's just books it's not children's books and grown-up books. It's just books. You can keep some of that alive all your life, you know? Just like, you know, whatever else is, it is that's in your soul that you want to get out there. But it's true, you know, the white-haired David Quinn talking to you is, is conscious of the fact that his experience changes you and, and there's that persona that maybe part of the persona is bad boy, but part of the persona is, you know, old man, <laughs> dad, teacher. When I teach martial arts, I my voice lowers a little bit, just naturally, <laughs> you know, you know, because you know, I have a pretty high voice, you know. And then, and then when I'm excited about comic books, my my voice kind of goes up a little bit, you know. So, um, so I don't know if is is persona something that is just natural and fluid, or is it is it a is it a duty? Is it a role that you are conscious of? Like when you go to a comic convention and you're signing a book for Faust, okay, well, this is, there's a persona and there's something that I have to live up to here versus I'm reading a, a children's book story at this event. Mm. Or is, or do you just naturally switch uh, between the two? Is this, or what is it? <laughs> what makes it livable and easy for me is that I, like I said, kind of at the beginning of this interview, it's like, if you put your work out into the world, then you've given everyone uh, you know thousands of different perceptions of you that that is who you are now you know i'm still trying to be true to myself but i'm also trying to acknowledge that what other people think i am is what i am it seems like social media has done that for everyone in a way mm. right whereas yeah, right. folks yeah, such sure. as ourselves have had to spend years decades you know really looking at you know those things what's the craft what am i doing why am i doing it and then having the you know making the choice to put it out there and then you know lo and behold instagram shows up and now everyone is just the flick of their thumb putting out this this persona i think we're all lucky we have lots of creative friends Right. We have lots of creative fans. The people that read our books are creative. The people that collaborate with us on them are creative. Um, the, the publishers and the editors and the business people are all creative in their own way, too. And so they're all going to stay open minded. And even if you meet somebody like it's happened a couple of times, now someone will say like, "Ooh, horror, not my thing. Hey, but. <laughs> Good job on that Kickstarter. You kicked ass. So, you know, they're accepting. David, this, this conversation was so fantastic. You know, it'll deepen all of our future conversations, I'm certain. 
Thank you. Thank I you. I think so too. I hope the recording was on. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> well, th thank thank you again. It's just an absolute pleasure. They say never never meet your heroes, but it, it you know that's not always the case. So today was a great day for me. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I and I just want to say I I really appreciate you putting yourself out there, not just in this interview, but in your work. I think so many people hold back, but but we're all we all benefit, you know, from you putting yourself out there. So then, thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Plugo, author, illustrator, comic creator, and the art director for Kung Fu Magazine for more than 20 years. But I'm here to talk to you about a project that's really special to me. It's the middle grade graphic novel, A Tiger's Tale. Imagine the story of tigers and dragons and martial artists and monsters. So when I launched the campaign for A Tiger's Tale Volume 1, I did not know what to expect but it succeeded thanks to a group of passionate backers. It was also awarded the Make More Comics art grant that year and was later featured as part of an art gallery exhibit. And that's why I'm coming to Kickstarter to cover production fees printing, copy editing, things like that. Books completed, with the exception of a few pages I've set aside for color over the course of the campaign. This turned out to be a popular feature of Volume One's campaign, so I thought I'd bring it back for Volume Two. I think it's gonna be great fun for everyone. Hope you'll support the campaign. I'm very excited about it. Thanks for stopping by. As a kid, I loved Kung Fu movies. So I went to Chinatown, trained with a wise teacher and became a Kung Fu master. Sounds simple, right? Not really. My journey, like the study of Kung Fu, was as arduous as it was rewarding, filled with as many secrets as revelations and as much heartache as triumph. It's a defining moment in my life. And while I began studying Kung Fu to learn how to fight, what I discovered was a way to live. Martial arts never came easy to me. I was far from talented and even farther from being the chosen one. It was only through years of tenacious perseverance that I was able to make steady progress. And so I was surprised when my master told me that I should teach Kung Fu and share the art outside of Chinatown. I did just that and taught Kung Fu to my own students for 20 years. I always wanted to do more to share the art of Kung Fu with others, but was limited by only being able to teach those within my immediate area. What about the rest of the world? Then one day, I had one of the deepest insights about Kung Fu. I realized that the punches, kicks, throws, and myriad of martial maneuvers are merely the delivery system for the true essence of Kung Fu, the philosophy and way of life. Having worked for years as a professional artist and storyteller in film, animation, video games, and comic books, I realized that I could draw upon this unique skill set to share my passion for Kung Fu with the greater world. And so I created Shadow Ghost, a Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. The first issue is created entirely by myself, from story and art to colors and lettering. Every panel is filled with unprecedented accuracy in its depiction of Kung Fu by a comic book creator who knows from first-hand experience what it means to be a Kung Fu master. Battle Ghost is a martial arts coming of age story about a young man whose search for the truth about a legendary hero leads him to study Kung Fu and through a twist of fate becomes part of the legend himself. 
For the first time in comic book history, you can immerse yourself further in each issue with Kung Fu Skills technology powered by Tiger Crane Kung Fu. Scan the QR code at the back of the comic and follow an exclusive link to an online instructional video where I teach you Kung Fu techniques featured in the series. With Kung Fu Skills technology, you can do more than just read about the Shadoku Saga. You can become a part of it. The first issue is completely finished and ready for print. All that's needed is for you to make a pledge of support so that we can fund the printing of the first issue. Together, we can share the wisdom of Kung Fu with the greater world. Shadow Ghost is the story of Kung Fu. It's about the people, the art, the culture, and the philosophy. It's my story, and the story of those that I've learned from, taught, fought, and loved. Join me and become part of the vibrant legacy in a place and time where we might not be the chosen one, but where we can make a choice to be part of something bigger and greater than just ourselves. I'm Sifu Curtis Fujita, and this is Shadow Ghost, the Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master.